uh, blessed to our bodies, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, if those of you, Sam, Sam's going to come up here Sam, in a minute here, Sam Powdrill. So, Sam, um, I'm going a little bit off the cuff, so you may have to help me a little bit here, but you were a missionary kid raised in India and uh, went to nursing school in the school in London. Is that where you went? Okay, okay. got it. So, Sam's an interesting guy. So, he uh, he's a PA, but he's probably done more surgery than most of us, I would guess. And uh, so Sam really uh, was uh, one of the, the first eye surgeons at Tenwick. Is that right? And he started that. If you think about Tenwick, most of you know about Tenwick and what a great, what, what a great uh, eye ministry they have there. I mean, Sam was really the beginning of that. So um, Sam has spent his career serving the under, underserved and uh, he really, if you don't know him, you should get to know him. He's just one of those guys. You just, this picture just says it all. That's just who he is. He's just a likable, lovable guy. And uh, he just really has a heart for people. And uh, he has uh, uh, transitioned into uh, developing uh, mobile microscopes to help serve the, the need out there. And um, I am super excited that he's willing to come up and just give us a short devotional and uh, lead us off. And uh, so... Uh, I appreciate that, and while, feel free to eat while we're, while we're hearing from uh, Sam. But Sam, you want to come on up here, buddy? Uh, yeah. Can you help me set that Yes, is it hearing? Yeah, that's, that's good. That's, that's doing it. <laughs> okay. Um, so. Yeah, so. Okay. <laughs> this is always fun to come to COS. Uh, I'm sort of a, uh, um, always enjoy coming. I'm not an, really an ophthalmologist, but I uh, enjoy coming, and this is one of my favorite groups of people to share with, and I feel like there's a lot of people that I connect with and and really enjoy being with. So this is fun to get to do this. Um, Stan and I do a lot of work together, and I guess the by that is that I got roped into this today. Um, I haven't done much speaking, even though I taught for 15 years in the last year. I retired about in January 2020. It was a great time to retire because uh, COVID hit in March. <laughs> And teaching over Zoom was not not an interesting experience, really. So I was glad that I. I just got back to Africa um, in this year in in June uh, to do surgery again, and it was just a pleasure to be back. My hands were a little rusty, but uh, it was nice to be back at it. Um, so I thought I would get, have a little bit of an African theme this morning, uh, a lesson from the giraffe. So we'll we'll look at a little bit of uh, the giraffe, but in the meantime, I'd like to just share something from Liberia. This was in June, and uh, I just wanted to share this with you. Um, this was our last post-op day, and probably a post-op day, not mu you probably have a, rarely have a post-op day like this in the States. So, um, 
I'll just hit this then. So, um, this, like I said, this is a pr post op date, but I think it was more like a revival service. So it, it was very interesting. So. <laughs> These were all our patients from that day. You're singing, You're Able God, which is a... So many of these patients were just completely blind. Um, what the lady hadn't seen for 25 years. And uh, so pretty amazing carried on people like that. Again, I'd done it a lot in the past, but it was a new refresher and a new picker-upper to see this excitement after post-op, um, after s surgery. So I was thrilled to be back. I was back with Dan Graydon. We were working with Samaritan's Purse there. Okay. Um, Going back to our theme, um, the, uh, the giraffe is an interesting animal. Uh, I think all of us have an uh, interest in long neck with just the same number of vertebrae as we have, which is always a fascinating thing to me. But I wanted to take a few thoughts from the, the giraffe, um, and I have a couple of scriptures that I'd like to share along with that. So. The giraffe makes no sound. They, they are basically a mute animal. They probably make some grunts and some, but they don't make much sound. Um, we know how they communicate, but about every so often, a lot of them get together uh, in, a, in a big group, and I've seen a group as many as 50, and they just seem to come from nowhere. Most of the time, they're by themselves or with their young ones. They meet as a group of 50, um, and nobody knows how they get there uh, or whatever. But the interesting part that I really wanted to share, is that better? Okay. Is that better? Okay. The uh, interesting thing that um, about the giraffe is the way they eat, and I want to take some thoughts from that. Um, you'll see here... The, the, their main diet is the acacia tree. Now the acacia is, like most of the trees in Africa, are thorn trees. Uh, they are not a nice tree to work with. They are very rough. And when you look at the plains, you'll see that the bottom of the leaves and the branches are about the same height all over the Maasai plains. We work just a little ways from the Maasai plains. And the reason is, anyone take a guess why they're all the same height? It's the height of the giraffe, somewhere around 18 feet off the ground, right? Um, somewhere in that, uh, between 16 and 18 feet. And it's because they've reached as high as they can to eat those leaves. Um, why they choose the acacia, the taste or whatever, I'm not quite sure. But they pick around those thorns to get those little bitty pieces of leaf, and you can see there's not a lot of leaf on those, but that's their diet. So I want to just take a few thoughts from that. Um, God made them with lips and a tongue that navigates around those thorns to be able to get those nutritious leaves. And there, I think there's a lesson in that for us. Um, you know, the first one is reach high. And I think when we think of faith and working, following the Lord Jesus, we want to reach high. And that's, that's the first thing. The second is that um, food may be sparse, but you can find nutrition if you work at it and you stay focused. And uh, the, um, a giraffe, I love to watch them walk. They have this very slow walk, but each step is yards because of their long legs. And I think one of the keys to that is they keep walking to find their food. Um, and as Christians, we need to keep walking. Uh, it's easy to get stagnant and kind of 
sit still, uh, want to keep walking. Um, they travel alone, but yet there's a sense of community. And I think many ophthalmologists, many of you work alone, private practices, but this is a great group to come and, and have that sense of community. We don't know how the giraffes get there. We get here because of people like Matt Coley that remind us. And uh, so we get there. Um, but anyway, the, there's several things that I want to pick, and there's a verse that we all know that I just wanted to um, say, how do, we, how do we get some of that nutrition? How do we get there? Um, consistency, I think, is one of the things, a consistent trust in the Lord Jesus. And so you all know Proverbs 3, um, 5 and 6, but um, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding in all your ways, acknowledge him and he'll make your paths straight. Uh, beautiful verse, one that I've relied on many times. But I like the, two, the verse right before that. And it says, um, it says, let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you'll win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man, and then trust in the Lord. So I think something that our society has completely forgotten, and I think we really see it where we're here, love and faithfulness. Faithfulness to our family, our spouses, faithfulness to our jobs, faithfulness to our, our faith. Um, faithfulness is something that is, is, is lost very much in our society. And so I think that's one of the keys to getting around those thorns in life and finding the richness and nutrition uh, of, of faith in Jesus and, and uh, continued faith. So there, there's a couple of things. Um, Love, uh, something that is so misconstrued and misunderstood in our society today, um, but true agape love that puts somebody ab ahead of you, uh, Christ's love that first he shared with us, and then as Christians, that love for each other um, is, is so important. The, so how do you get around the thorns of life? There are thorns in life. We, we work around those, but God has given us tools just like the lips and the tongue of the giraffe to work around those, those thorns, those difficult things in life. What are the things that are keeping you from getting that nutritious life, giving food from Christ? Is it your time? Is it your busy schedule? Is it your practice? Is it your frustrations with things at home or work, um, busy traveling? Um, just busyness um, and the Lord wants us to, to try and get past some of those thorns in life what about temptations um, I think of this, this place here a lot of what's happening right here in Vegas is people fulfilling their temptations right um, and, and as Christians that is always a, something that we've got to watch out for is how do we keep on top and keep nutritious food and yet um, allow God's life to um, work through us and keep us from falling into temptation. I want us to read um, one verse as we, as I finish up, and I, I just love this. I've been diving into Hebrews again. You know, Hebrews is one of those books you think, yeah, let me do that later when i got more time to study. <laughs> and and it's, I've just been diving back into Hebrews a little bit and how great uh, our Lord Jesus is and what he, what he re who he really is and, and um, then what he has done for us in giving us life and forgiveness. This verse is so great. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, he knows our thorns, right? Uh, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. What an example. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need while we're going around those thorns. Um, I'm just thankful for the Lord, thankful for you people, and I just uh, um, um, 
thankful that, for this opportunity to share with you. And I hope you'll remember the lesson from the giraffe. So, um, our next speaker, many of you probably know, Dave Cook. Uh, so let me just tell you a little bit about Dave. And uh, he is uh, in practice at Great Lakes Eye Care with Stan uh, up in south southwest Michigan, I guess you would call it. And uh, it would be like, is this how you do it? Like here, Stan? Oh, this one. Oh, it's this one. All right, got it. Got it. Got it. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. So he was one of the uh, original, uh, the OG of the uh, of the Great Lakes Eye Care. Dave uh, did his uh, training in Michigan, I believe, and then went to Mayo Clinic and was asked to stay on at Mayo, but uh, decided to come back home to Michigan and start this practice. They now have a uh, very busy practice with four locations, lots of lots of doctors, and they've really done an amazing job of creating a faith-based practice and one that I. Uh, like to model many things after so um, we are grateful to have Dave here to talk to us um, a couple little tidbits about Dave you may not know he's um, kind of an IOL formula guru guy so if you have any IOL formula questions you can ask him he's also kind of a Bible quiz guy so if you have any really challenging Bible quiz questions you can ask Dave um, and uh, Dave I was gonna ask you what two parts are there in the Bible do you know two parts to the Bible? Do you know there's, yeah, good, all right, yeah, he's he's an expert at this. Okay, so I'm very grateful to have him up here. Dave, you wanna come up here, buddy? I was gonna ask you a harder question, but I don't wanna put you on the spot. Good morning. Have you ever heard someone say, don't pray for patience because God will give it to you? Well, um, I would challenge that. I, I do that often in a little bit different way. People say, how are you doing? And my answer is, I'm ready. And they usually say, for what? And then I say, whatever. Bring it on. And the reason is, that's what I pray. I often will pray, God, whatever it is, if it's from you, I'm ready. Bring it on. Why would I do that? Why would you pray for patience? Why would I pray whatever? And, and the reason is because I have a rock-solid confidence that God is sovereign and God loves me. And if you really believe those two things then it follows that anything that comes is helpful because God wouldn't let it come otherwise. And um, there's a verse, the temptations, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, the temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted he will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, 
And the temptation here, some versions call it trial. When you're tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. So if you really believe, I, I'm, not, I, I'm talking pretty much to myself here and I'm about myself, and I'm just kind of giving my self-talk. So that's what today's talk is. It's my self-talk. And um, so I'm talking to myself. I'm letting you in on it. How's that? But basically, if, because I'm convinced that I'm not going to get anything too hard for me, then I pray, bring it on, Lord, because I know it'll be for my good. Now, when I get it, it's one of two things. It's either a gift that I really like, or it's a chisel, which I don't really like, but the chisels have been really helpful in my life. And my wife would say I'm a much softer person because of the chisel. Uh, my kids would say I'm more gentle. My staff would say, I'm not sure my staff would say I'm gentle. <laughs> but I think those that have followed me uh, for 20, 30 years would say I am more gentle. And the reason is it's the chisel. And so I, when, when bad stuff comes, I just say, God, thank you for the chisel. I, it's hard to thank him for some of the bad stuff, but it's not hard to thank him for the chisel. Another verse, always be joyful, three verses. Never stop praying. Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. How many times have we, have I asked, God, I wish I knew what your will was? Well, here it tells us. And it says his will is for us to be thankful in every one of the circumstances. And when I'm thankful for the chisel or for the thing I really like, you know, it says eat honey because it's good. So sometimes it's honey that I like because it's good. Sometimes it's a chisel I don't like. But either way, I can be thankful that God brought it. And that comes out of a confidence that God is sovereign. And that ends up and brings me joy, which is the topic. Oh, I'm going to back up one. Mental illness runs really strong in my family tree, and my uh, immediate family has not been spared. This was about a year ago. Uh, I got a phone call that uh, someone was in the ICU seizing because of an intentional overdose. Seven hours away, and so we get in our car and we start driving. And what was my self-talk? It was God. I asked for healing. This is my prayer. I asked for healing. I asked that there won't be a chronic vegetative state. But whatever it is, your will be done. And we know that's a really powerful prayer because Jesus prayed it. And there's a lot of power in what he prayed. You know, not my will, but your will be done. He knew what was coming. He didn't want it, but it was really, really good. It was really good for all of us, right? He knew that was the plan, and he knew it might be hard, but it was really good. So he prayed, bring it on, not my will, but yours. What was my self-talk? Was this yet another disappointment in a long string of poor choices? Or was it an event that God allowed that would somehow be for my good? I chose the latter because I believe that God is good and I believe that God loves me. And sometimes I need to suffer. Suffering's not always bad. So I am the practice manager managing partner, and Stan, you guys know Stan, Stan was, uh, he came and said, uh, this a few years back, I think Shelly and I want to go overseas to Ecuador for a while. How long? I don't remember what he said, but it was in the range of a year or two or whatever, it was a long time, more than a weekend. And 
uh, I remember saying, uh, Stan, if God wants you there, then I don't want you here. But it's not going to be easy. But it's okay because sometimes we're supposed to suffer. Sometimes suffering is good for us. Stan said, I don't want you to suffer. I don't. And I said, Stan, there's going to be more call. We're going to have less, pe less doctors. There's going to be less income. And Stan said, I don't want that. Well, my self-talk became my verbal talk, and that's, it's all right. If it's from God, it'll be all right. Turned out Stan was right. We didn't suffer. That's a whole other story. But uh, we, didn't, we didn't suffer in terms of more call. We didn't suffer in terms of less money. Um, but the point was is when something comes at you, you don't know the back end. You just know the front end. And on the front end, what's your self-talk? Mine is that God is sovereign. He'll not bring me more than I can bear. I thank him for the chisel. In this case, even if it didn't come. Oh, by the way, on the, uh, the ICU thing, that turned out just fine. And that was another one that didn't come. COS breakfast. It's a little nicer than that cup of coffee. But uh, Stan asked if I was coming to COS this year, or to ASCRS. I said, no, not this year, because I've got some email friends from Europe, and I want to go to the ESCRS. I've never met them, and I want to meet them. And they're going to be there. And so I didn't come to this. And he said, well, would you consider coming in to talk? And I said, well, so I prayed about it, kind of hoping for a no. Um, but I didn't get a no, so I said, yes, why? Because if God's asking me to do it, then it'll be good. And uh, that's the same kind of cousin of the same conversation. Bring it on, Lord. I'm trusting that you'll make it valuable for at least one person. Please move hearts and make what I say become valuable for you. May, we, may whatever I say hit the target for someone. The point is that God is sovereign. If he's calling me, he has a plan, and I don't need to worry. He'll come through. Because I was coming, another opportunity opened up that wouldn't have, one that I really wanted to do. And in addition, the ESCRS moved its date, so I wouldn't have gone anyway. So I would have had nothing. Trusting is what that's really about. But trusting in a sovereign God doesn't mean you give up. So I thought I'd give one story about Bible quizzing, which was men mentioned. Now, Bible quizzing is not where I know the answers. What Bible quizzing is is where you learn a whole bunch of material, and then they ask you questions, and your team competes. And the questions aren't, like, super tough. It's they'll start into a verse, and you got to finish it. So the better you have this stuff memorized, the better you do. And so um, one of my sons memorized through his years in Bible quizzing. Now, you, it would be to start at the beginning of this book and quote all the way through. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, First and Second Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and James. Um, and so you get it in, and I was in it since I was eight years old. I, I don't remember because there were too many versions in between. I keep getting a different version and keep messing it up. But uh, the point is, is I'm a fan, I guess is the point. And so when we went to uh, Rochester, Minnesota, we had been running a quizzing program in Ann Arbor. And so we went there and I remember saying to Jeanette, okay, I'm, I'm, this year, I'm, when I'm here, it takes so much stinking time, I'm just gonna do ophthalmology. And then when I'm done with ophthalmology, then we'll go back to Bible quizzing. Well, God gave us just such a strong tug uh, to get started. So we went ahead and got started. And we had uh, 20, um, I, I, I called, cold called 200 churches and gave 50 demonstrations and 27 churches got involved. I don't say that to say I'm amazing. I say that to say I didn't just pray, God, please make this happen. So... The self-talk that God is sovereign doesn't make me stop working. I work hard. I want to win the prize. I want God to say, well done. So that's why I work hard. This whole self-talk thing about 
God, you're in charge, that has to do with my thoughts. That has to do with my, how do I interpret the world as it comes past me? Negative self-talk. Why me? Why did this happen? I'm not surprised. It never ends up in my favor. It's once again my unlucky day. I've heard that a ton. Not from myself. Job and Joseph. So Job ends up, he's at the end of his severe suffering, and he says, why, God? Why did you do this? I don't do very well with why questions. I like why science questions, but the social, spiritual questions, I pretty much say it's above my pay grade. And, but Job asked, and what was his answer? It's above your pay grade. God said, who are you to ask me? That was his answer. What about Joseph? Joseph has all this bad stuff that happens, and Joseph says, when his brothers are there, and he's, um, they're now worried because now he's in charge, and they've been so mean to him. And he spent, I don't know how many years in prison and suffering all wrongfully. None of it was his fault. Would he have said that was a good? He didn't say it was good. He said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Good came out of it. So I thank God for the good. I, try, I want to be like Joseph. I want to be like Job. So I don't want to be like Job. I want to be like Joseph. I work with a group called Life Action Ministries, and uh, I'm on the board. And Life Action, it, it, it's a group that goes into churches, and they spend a long time with the church, and it's uh, several weeks or days sometimes. And they've been in 7,000 different churches, and every one of their speakers would say that the number one problem in the church is bitterness because of lack of forgiveness. Bitterness alert statements. Why me? That's bitterness toward God. Again, woe is me. Can you believe what they did? I can't believe what she did. No one should ever be treated the way I was. Given what they've been done to me, how could I ever... I have hurts. I've been wounded. Those are all kind of bitterness alerts. Perhaps you've said that. Perhaps you've heard it. I certainly have. I love this little byline of COS. Ophthalmology is more than science. Science is pretty straightforward. But a lot of us mess up on the other stuff, right? It's a lot more than science. And these stories, many of these stories, I got a few here, they're stories about bitterness and a lot of them involve physicians. And being a physician doesn't make it work. That's just the science part. There's more involved. One of my brother's heroes was his father-in-law, Lou. Lou died. My brother had gotten divorced before this. And Lou's wife wouldn't let my brother come to the wedding. Thank you. Funeral. Wouldn't let him come to the funeral. Why? After all he's done, how could I let him come to the funeral? That's a sign of, that's a bitterness alert. I know Jan and Jill very well. I'm going to change the stories just a little bit here. I'm going to go into the first person. I'll wear this hat for Jan and a different hat for Jill. So right now I'm Jan talking, okay? Several years ago, when we had three little kids, my siblings had a family reunion in Destin, Florida. It was the first one we had. They didn't ask me about it. They told me about it. And they said, uh, we're going to all meet in the same house. We'll stay at the house. And here's when it starts. Here's when it finishes. They had older kids. I had little kids. It was going to involve for me two airports, two airplanes, a rental car. They didn't have car seats back then in rental cars. So I got to find car seats, and then there's a long drive from any airport. You can't get to Destin from here. 
They didn't care. They didn't ask me. They never asked my opinion. That was very hurtful. I didn't matter to them. I'll show them. I'm just not going to come to anymore. Sister Jill. None of us have any idea why Jan won't come to our family reunions. Last year, she came for a few minutes to the one we had in Chicago. Some of her grown kids were there, over 30 years old. They came up to my kids and had to be introduced. First cousins, didn't even know each other, despite all of our family reunions. We all thought that when Jan married, her husband didn't like us. Jan always said, sounded kind of interested in when we said we were having a family reunion. And she said, I'll check with my husband. After a while, we quit asking her. We just informed her. We knew she wasn't going to come. It's been like this for almost 30 years. One year, we were having a reunion in Orlando area. And my dad was on the flight to Orlando with her and her whole family. But they didn't come. They were there the whole time. Same city but they didn't come. It's no use putting Jan through the heartache of having her ask, explain about her husband, so we don't ask. She's either had to choose her new family or us. This past year, the real story came out. The problem was Jan's hurts not her husband's dislike of the family. Jen forgave her siblings. I'm not even sure if they asked for forgiveness. They had their first reunion this month, a few weeks ago, over July 4th. Everyone was there. It was the best time ever. Jen even invited them all to her house for ice cream one night. Sorry. Left that one off. Verse, see to it that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many have become defiled. It's huge. Catch it at the root. Just forgive. When we forgive, we give the offense to God. When we uh, wait, 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 just a second. Many are defiled by bitterness. You can only be bitter when you get less than what you think you deserve. When we forgive, we give the offense to God. When we get less, when we think we deserve something, that's pride. You can only be bitter through pride. But if you give it up to God, don't say, I will get even for this wrong. Don't be like Jan. Wait for the Lord to handle the matter. Let him take care of it. You be grateful. Let, trust in the sovereign God that he knows what he's doing and he'll bring along the right things and let him, let him handle the matter. That allows me to be able to separate the issues and the chisel or the nice thing, whatever it is. I can go on my way and those don't have to affect me. When we forgive, we give the offense to God. So forgive and don't get even. Wait for the Lord to handle the matter. It might have been a terrible, unspeakable injury. It might be people involved with prison. They might not ask for forgiveness. The question is not what happened, but what will your self-talk do with this? Will you try to get even? Will you give it to God to deal with in his timing? When you forgive, there's incredible joy. Humility is giving it to God. Letting go, God gives grace to the humble. You have to have grace to heal. Thank him in your self-talk for the chisel. He loves you. He's sovereign. There's incredible joy in being free. Thank you. Well, I know some of you got to step out. Um, we uh, have about 15 more minutes. You are welcome to stay and hang out and talk. I'm so grateful that you all came. And, uh, and we just are, are real blessed by this fellowship of a 
of ophthalmologists. And so thank you for being here and be safe getting home. We'll see you hopefully in Palm.